is, is I'm excited about what I'm going to teach on today. I talked a little bit last night um, about the power of your words. And uh, when you think about it in that way, it's like a whole new meaning. Um, and how, how powerful your words are uh, based on Jesus on the inside of you. We have the power to cast out devils. Amen. We have the power to curse cancer. Amen. And in the same situation, we can curse our finances. We can curse our family. Right. Meaning, because we have so many that are new here this morning, that we in turn can curse our finances by saying that giving never works. I'll never get out of debt. All power of heaven and earth is in you has said that. That's good. Okay, I want you to kind of think about what I'm saying because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be downloading a lot. This is not a miracle service. We're teaching. Okay, so it'll be fun, but this is a time when I'm going to hammer through so much information. That's why it's so important that you have the, the manual that goes with it. And because um, the manual, I, most of the notes are actually in the manual. And, uh, but the thing is, I want to encourage you. There's another area I wanted to address this morning in regards to that. <clears throat> the word says, honor a prophet, receive a prophet's reward. What does that mean? I was raised that you honor the prophet, you give the prophet water, and you get pregnant. Which is what, it, what happened in the Bible. You honored the prophet, made room for the prophet, which is type and shadow of Jesus. You made room for the prophet in the home. And, uh, and then what do you want? And she wanted a son. She got pregnant. She got a son. So John, John Paul Jackson, uh, I, I've known him since before we were both, when we were both um, naturally brunette. Uh, over 35 years ago... Uh, <laughs> I, is when I, I first met him, before he was even in ministry. And, uh, and so we, we hung out a few years ago. Obviously, he's with the Lord now. He's hanging out with my parents. But, uh, but we were in a meeting together, and I made sure he had plenty of water. If it, his bottled water was getting low, I would fill it up. And at least seven times. I got seven grandkids. It works, okay? <laughs> but there's more to that than just do it, getting a son, I got, you know, three grandsons and four granddaughters, and I'm going to have more, so I'm looking for another prophet. So I keep giving Patricia water, which is good, Patricia King. And, uh, but uh, honor a prophet, receive a prophet's reward. Dishonor a prophet, and you will lose the prophet's reward. Now, honoring a prophet does not mean, oh, we honor you, Joan Hunter. No, it's whenever you think of me, say, God bless Joan Hunter. Now, what I'm speaking over you is you're going to lay hands on the sick. They're going to recover. Amen. That you're going to be healed, body, mind, soul, spirit, and finances. Amen. That this is what I teach. This is what you're going to experience healing in all of those areas today. And if you go and you criticize me because my lipstick is too dark, or my hair doesn't look the same, or cr constantly, cri and she went so long. Well, you know what? I have 45 years of information I'm going to share in about four and a half hours. <laughs> Okay, so I'm, I'm going to be cramming it as fast as I can. But if you dishonor me, what you're doing is cutting off the blessings and everything I'm speaking over you. You've heard the term, I had my pastor for lunch. Okay, when you just talk about your pastor and backbite your pastor. And everything that the pastors have said, no matter where you go to church, everything that they have spoken over you, blessings, you have cut them off by the power of your words. Amen. That is a great word. You're welcome. Uh, no, but see, and, and even on TV... I just can't stand her, the way she's doing her hair. Look at that outfit. You have no idea what she's saying. But anything she's saying, or, you know, obviously more of a she or a he, everything you're saying is now being cut off where you're concerned. If you have a problem with how, how they look, just walk in the other room, but still listen. If you have a problem with what they're saying, like a CD. You know, if you don't like the way I look, buy my CDs, not my DVDs. Okay? Yeah, that's right, man. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 you should see me in the morning. You should praise God how I look now. <laughs> I wake up and I go, whoa! Oh, yeah. Not the Holy Ghost. It ain't the Holy Ghost. And, uh, 
that reminds me, I have a book called You Can Prophesy, and it teaches you how to prophesy, and it teaches you how to prophesy over yourself. It's like getting up in the morning, going to the mirror, and go, whoa, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's me. Nobody broke in. And uh, <laughs> thank God for makeup, that's for sure. And isn't that the truth? And all the men said, amen. Okay. And, uh, but I teach you how to prophesy over yourself. Like go into the mirror and point to the mirror and say, today God's going to meet your every need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You can start prophesying these scriptures over you and you're going to start seeing them happen. That today is your day that God's going to point to you as an example of his incredible wealth, yeah. of his favor and kindness and all he's done for you through Christ Jesus. Yeah. Well, oh, what a great prophetic word. It's Ephesians 2 verse 7. Yeah. It's in the word. You need to know how to prophesy to yourself. Amen. Everybody wants a prophetic word, you know, for themselves. You're, you're getting it, but you're getting it in groups. You're going to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. Isn't that good? That Jesus Christ is going to heal you in your body, mind, soul, spirit, and finances today. Glory to God. You're going to have wisdom, how to deal with your family, how to fix your husband, and all kinds of stuff. I mean, uh, um, and your wife and your kids, Okay. And, uh, and so I just want you to understand that this is a time and a season where there, the healing, I believe right now, it's time for healing. Yes. Meaning, not only getting healed, but get, putting it in full gear for you to go forth and lay hands on the sick no matter where you are. Yeah. Family reunions, whatever it is, they may have made fun of you, but when they're sick, they're going to call you. Okay? And I love Cal and Michelle Pierce in the healing rooms. I found out that there's, I think, over 2,000 worldwide right now. But you know what? Your home needs to be a healing room. Yeah. <clears throat> your neighbors, your friends need to know that they can actually come to your home and get healed. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, there's about three hours right there. <laughs> and if this isn't too hot, I'm going to take a little sip of it. And uh, those of you that have your manuals, uh, the word, what I was talking about, the words, that is on page number 81. We're not going to turn to it because I've already talked about that. And uh, if you would, um, I've already talked about authority, which is page 27. 52, you don't have to turn to it. It's going to be about anger. Amen. This is really good, whoever made it. Yummy. Yes, very good. And, uh, but anger comes from unmet expectations. Now, I, I love the way that these pastors teach. I told Jacob, I said, I would love to have a church like this in Texas. Absolutely love. I know we'll eventually have a church like this in, at our headquarters, but currently we don't have a church. And uh, church, you know, we have conferences, we don't have church. Because they, I, I you know, I love Mark Sharona. I, he is a very, very dear friend of mine. But when he's done, I need my husband to interpret. <laughs> he is so brilliant. He has so many degrees. And, and I can catch about half of what he says. And I'm knowledgeable. And, you know, but it's like I take the word and make it in, in, so that everybody can understand it. Amen. Okay. And, and the way that you talk about the parables, because see, and I tell stories. Jesus told parables. They're basically the same thing. Yeah. But see, you learn through that. Yeah. You know, instead of the analytical, let's exit Jesus, whatever that is, you know. It's like, <laughs> Jesus is exiting? I mean, I don't know. You know. Now, I really do know what it means, I think. And, uh, <laughs> and so, um, but anger comes from unmet expectations. So, I'll give you an example. And I'm going to start off by saying, do not judge me, because that's not good for you to judge me. Right. Okay? And so, I, I was in North Platte, Nebraska, and there was three of us traveling. And we only had meetings at night. And then normally I ate one major meal a day. One meal meal a day. And I'll have like a little snack in the morning, a little snack at night. And so <clears throat> I'm over there. And so we met about uh, 1.30, 2 o'clock to go have lunch. So we went to eat, went to this restaurant. Nobody was there. You know, it, it was wide open. And the sign says, wait to be seated. They were serious. <laughs> So we waited, and eventually the guy comes out and said, you can sit anywhere, because literally there wasn't anybody else there. Somebody will be out with you in just a moment. No, they were not. 
We waited. So she comes out. By then, we know that we want three iced teas because we're from Texas, okay? And uh, so we said, okay, we want three iced teas. So we waited and waited, and she eventually came back with two iced teas and a water. But at least we were all hydrated, <laughs> okay? So at that point, she says, I'll be right back. No. Some of you are getting angry thinking about this happening to you. Okay, so we go over and, and she eventually brings a tea back. I tell her, I said, we would like to have such and such as an appetizer. She says, I'm sorry, we don't serve that here. That's at the other restaurant in town. Two restaurants in town. That's at the other one. I said, um, it's, um, it's right here on your menu. Are you aware that I could have you fired because you don't know what's on the menu? And I mean, how stupid can you be? I, I feel those eyes coming at me. Don't judge me. Okay. And how, I mean, how hard is it to get three teas? It's harder to get two teas and a water than it is to get three teas. God. Yeah. Praise God. Watch us say grace. Fake tip, fake $20 bill for a tip. Yeah, yeah, a fake $20 bill track for a tip. <laughs> oh, I've been so in so many meetings like that. I did not do that, just so that you know, and yes, you are forgiven for judging me anyway. <laughs> and so I did not do that. But that's, you can feel the anger in you about the possibility of that happening to you. Now, I have eaten with people that have totally annihilated the waitress or the waiter. Oh, it's so wrong. I used to be married to him. I'll give you, I'll give you an example. When he takes the children out, my daughter's out to eat now. They'll go, I'll be right back. I need to go to the restroom. They give the waiter or waitress an extra 20. They say, take care of that man or you'll regret it. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> That's very true. Okay. But the thing is, and, and I said, well, I said, you know, it's on your menu. And she says, I'm really sorry. I've been out for a while. My son is very sick. He's in the hospital right there that you can see. And they called me today and says, if you don't come in, you'll lose your job and your insurance. They're care flighting him from North Platte to the Denver Hospital tonight. He's nine months old. He's not known a day of health and hopes that he will survive after he goes to Denver. And his aunt, her aunt was there taking care of him, being there with him. And no wonder she could care less about an appetizer. Okay. If I had done that, I could not ask her the next question. Like what you said. <laughs> Want to go to church with me? <laughs> no. Are they all like that? Yeah. No, there's hypocrites in church. Yeah, no joke. <laughs> you know? And, uh, but the thing is, and, I, and because I, I was nice to her, I said, may I pray for him? And she said, yes. So we joined hands and we prayed. We sent the word of healing to Josiah down the street. And I said, you will hear from the hospital before we leave our meal. So long story short, we got appetizer. It was great. Meals were great. She now had peace in her heart. And we're walking out the door. She comes running after us. And they said, we don't know what has happened. That he, Josiah has taken a turn for the good. Come on. Isn't that good? Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. So there is an example of what anger is. If you don't let it go. That's a good song. It's a good name for a song. Let it go. Let it, okay, yeah. Okay. I have granddaughters. And I also like the movie. But uh, I think that's one of the most powerful teachings. Because we're going to talk about forgiveness today. And you've got to let it go. You know. And, uh, but the thing is, it's like that Josiah potentially could have been dead if I got angry. Because she sure would not have let me pray. I probably wouldn't have asked her if I had gotten angry. And so, but if you hang on to the anger, it will turn into bitterness. And bitterness will age you. Yuck, yuck. Okay? So, uh, now we're going to talk about generational curses. Turn to page 71 if you have a manual. And this is called, the title of this is Breaking Generational Curses. 
And uh, Sarah, if you'll just run that back to the table in case somebody needs it. Okay? And, um, but this is, once again, breaking generational curses and covenants. You're going to learn some things today that you never have never really thought about. Not potentially that you haven't heard, but most people don't teach this. And what's so awesome is that, you know, like Randy Clark teaches a lot of what I teach now. He devours my books. I, first time I met him, I took him a whole sack of my books. He says, I've already read all those. I went, thank you very much. <laughs> Great. That didn't hurt my feelings, you know, because I know that he's kind of more popular in this area. And Bill Johnson has been in services and spent hours taking notes, yeah. learning about trauma, learning about stress. And now his students in Reading are, know about trauma. John Arnett and Carol, you know, they've been healed in the area uh, of something that was brought on by a traumatic event. Okay, and, because, and now they incorporate that. And so God has used me to help the leaders. I do learn from them too. Amen. Okay, so, but, uh, but, you know, and then Randy, I've, I've for, written a forward to a book and, and an endorsement for another book. And uh, his um, person that helps him write, Craig Miller, is ordained under this ministry. Amen. And ministers with me, and of course with Randy too. But we're going to talk about generational curses. Generational curses are passed down through the bloodline. Okay, now that's kind of a, a normal situation. Some people say generational curses are broken at when you get saved. But you still have diabetes, which most time is a generational curse. Okay, I would like to believe that in the uh, spirit realm they are, in the soulish realm, which is the natural, they're not broken. So they, there needs to be a step in regards to that for you to get completely uh, set free of any generational curses. You may say, "What is a general generational curse?" You go to the doctor, and there's a list of things. Is this in your family? You hit a check. That's a generational curse. Whether you have it or not, it's in your DNA right. that you are in, inclined to get that, right. okay? And, uh, and so it's very important that we get rid of this. In addition to that, um, blood transfusions. You open yourself up to other people's uh, blood and generational curses, okay? And I'm going to give you an example that just happened this morning. Uh, somebody that came for prayer, the child was too young to stay. And, um, and I'll, I'll just, I'll tell you, because you don't, you don't, and this is, this is great teaching material here. This little girl um, who is here had a heart transplant shortly after birth. And, uh, and so it's like God bless both families of the donor of the heart, okay? And, uh, and so, and now... She says, she said, her mom says, you're such a beautiful little girl. She said, but I'm a boy. She asked me this morning, she says, I wonder if it was a boy's heart. I said, probably. Yeah. Kind of an interesting example that just happened about 30 minutes ago here. I mean, that's very powerful just, you know, making that statement. I've, I've had others that are inclined to same sex after they've had a blood transfusion or a transplant of some kind. So what you do is it opens it up to, to other people's generational curses and things like that. Because there's power in the blood. There's power in the blood of Jesus, but there's also power in our blood. And, uh, and so, um, so we, we prayed with her for, for all of that to be cut off, any generational curses that came in through that blood transfusion and the transplanted heart. And, um, and so then in addition to that, you've got the body part transplant, which was that example. But then you've also um, got the blood transfusion. Then you also have, um, I'm going to give you another example. When I was in Raleigh, North Carolina last year, I had been communicating with this lady. And, uh, and she says, there's got to be something wrong here. This has to be something from my donor cornea. Whoever donated my cornea. And she had a cornea transplant about two years ago. She saw me on Sid Roth. Got totally, completely healed by putting her hand on the TV while I was on Sid Roth. And she, she goes, she would shut her eyes and go to sleep. And there's all these people looking at her. But she doesn't know them. It's the, the person who donated their cornea. It's the last people that saw her before she died. And that's called cellular memory. And that image was transferred. It's in the memory of every cell of your body, whatever it is. 
Okay, and so she got set free, and, and I got to meet her, and it was just so exciting. There's so much in regards to that situation. I'm looking forward to seeing her again next month. She's from South Africa, and her she doesn't type in a South African accent, so I was really surprised. <laughs> you have such a cute little accent. Let's give your testimony. And uh, I have, uh, for those of you that have uh, Facebook, I have Joan Hunter public page, and I post hundreds of testimonies on there, and, and her testimony is on there from about a year ago. And absolutely life changing, and uh, and so in addition to that, which we will go over today, is pornography. Pornography, when you look at the screen, it is literally burned on your cornea, burned into your eyes, burned into your your memory. There's a lot more to it, but we're going to deal with that today. And what that does is this prayer, and you ask God to wipe away the yeah. images. Yeah. God will wipe away the images from a transplant. He'll wipe away the images of when you were raped, when you were molested, any of that kind of stuff. And then also uh, any, anything that you have seen, you know, like there, um, on my teaching on Erase the Pain of Your Past, there's a Vietnam vet, uh, and for 42 years, his helicopter went down in, every night and exploded with him in it. Until we prayed. Amen. And he got healed. He got Amen. his neck healed. He grew. He, he gave, rededicated his life to the Lord. And doesn't remember. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I'm going to just throw this in here. PTSD. Post-traumatic stress disorder. A little bit is from vets. A little bit firemen. A little bit policemen. And a whole lot domestic violence. Yeah. Majority of them are domestic violence. Either child, spousal you know, that type of thing. There's a lot of that. That is a label. And then people live up to that label and that makes them dysfunctional. I know there's reality in PTSD. I understand that. But there's also healing, yeah. you know, where that's concerned. And that is another label that we need to remove from us and not live up to. Okay? Now, there's a movie. You talked about a movie. There's a movie coming out next month called Stronger. I know it's going to be released in Houston first. Uh, I met the producer and partial writer of that the other day, about a month ago, in my office. It deals with PTSD, and, and there is no healing at the end of it. It just, it, and I told her, I said, you realize with this, because I saw the trailer and everything, I said, you're opening up a can of worms right. with PTSD. So as the body of Christ, you need to know how to deal with PTSD. Yeah. Okay, and, and, as, and you'll, you'll learn that. Is, is there anybody here with that? But, okay, quite a few of you. Okay, so we'll deal with that and use you as an example in a little bit. And, but this movie, I have been asked to have my healing team of Houston there at the movie theater to minister to these people. Awesome. Awesome. Which is awesome. I have also offered to have a meeting at our facility before next month with the area pastors and whoever wants to learn about this to actually have a meeting and train them before the movie is released. Because you're going to need to, if that movie comes up here, you're going to need to know, especially this church, of how to deal with that. And this, it targets primarily war vets. Because, you know, I, I praise God that there's a shift happening in uh, retired vets and finances. So it, it, they, they've gone through enough hell, they don't need to be living on the streets. That's just my opinion, okay? And, uh, but, but we're going to go through this. Generational curses in the Bible, once again, page number 71. And it talks about generational curses, and it begins with a word curse. And then I'm not going to read the book. That's your job, okay? And, uh, and this is a simple prayer. We've all got, had, you know, some form of generational curses. Now, uh, do y'all have a son? Two. Two sons, okay. And how old are they? 31 and 20. Back to 20, back to 20. Okay. Are they both married? I got a daughter. Okay. Anyway. Yeah, three of them are married. I have one that's not married yet, but it's, he's going he's to be the absolute best ever. And, uh, but the point is, I know that y'all have blessed them. That's a generational blessing. Amen. Okay, so understand there's generational curses and there's generational blessings. In particular, more specifically from the father. And uh, can it come from the mother? Say that again? Yeah. From the father. Yeah. From the father. 
from the Father. I mean, I mean it as a truth, not me. I'm just saying. People. I know. You need to know this. There's too many fatherless children yeah. on the streets. Okay? And, I mean, you look around, and we probably have 10% men in here, maybe 20. Okay? This is a time and a season for the men to rise to the occasion and do all that God's called them to do, Amen. lay hands on the sick, and, and not just let the women do it. Right. Okay? So that was, that was good there. And, uh, but as a mom, I have given my generational blessing to my girls. Okay? But it's the Father's blessing in the Father's heart. Okay? There are no male and female in Christ, so understand that. It's a good word. If you know somebody that doesn't have a father and you're a guy, be a father like to them. Amen. We were talking today in, in the car on the way here. And, you know, and, I, and I, Steve and Sarah have a daughter that lives in New York. And so she's dating somebody, dating two guys. One treats her like a jerk. And one treats her like a woman and a princess. Okay, so it's kind of narrowing down to the one obviously. But the thing is, is so many people in the church don't know how to treat a woman. Okay? They don't know how to treat their moms, probably because they haven't seen their dad treat their mom good. And so I told Steve and Sarah, I said, I said, Steve, you know, has set a really, really high example of what a dad or a husband needs to be. And I don't know any man that can do that. But he has passed that blessing on to the two sons. And now the daughter is expecting it. Because that's just normal. Beautiful. Okay? And, uh, you know, and it's, and it's like, you know, it's like, does that make you any... Spe- I can open my door. I, you know, I mean, I get in my car and I open my door and I get out and in and whatever. But you know what? It's really nice to make sure that, they're, that somebody is secure. When I'm walking down the streets of New York, I don't want to be walking alone. Am I afraid? Absolutely not. But I know who I am and who, what God's called me to do, and I protect that anointing. Amen. Okay? And I use wisdom. You know, it's like if I stop late at night, there's somebody else with me. I need to go into the store. I don't go in alone. It's called wisdom. Because people know who I am, and, and I'm recognized a lot on the street, okay? Or in Israel, wherever it happens to be. Literally, people come running after me the other day on the streets of Jerusalem. Joan Hunter! And I'm like, I'm the only one Joan Hunter here in Israel right, right now. <laughs> okay, but here's a prayer for the generational curses. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And because uh, this is lab, this is time. This is, and, and the thing is, what we're going to be spending more time today is dealing with the root causes. What has actually opened the door for this sickness? And sin usually is the answer. And so you repent for the sin. It may be generational sin. I don't know why I have lung cancer. I've only smoked three packages of cigarettes a day. You know what I'm saying? I mean, there's wisdom in that too, okay? This is not condemnation. This is self-examination, okay? And, and we've, we're going to look at ourselves. So now we're going to start off with generational curses. Then we're going to continue into if we have ever had any kind of uh, blood transfusion. Now, to just to explain that a little bit more, the Rogam shot, RH negative factor. <clears throat> if you've had a Rogam shot, I personally think they're absolutely amazing. I, I'm not RH negative. But to keep it so that you don't have a problem with the baby, the next, the next one, I just think that's amazing. But the Rogam Rogam shot itself is made from multiple people's blood. So you get a little mini blood transfusion in a little shot. Now, and I mentioned this last night, but the GMOs, genetically, genetically, genetically modified organisms, whose genetics? Hmm. The hybrid tomatoes, hybrid with human DNA to be bigger. Not flavorful, not full of vitamins, but bigger. Okay, you can go to first Google and look it up. Okay? Because that's not in the Bible. Because everything was organic in the Bible. Everything is organic in Israel now, which is like really awesome. And uh, it still is because they, they, don't, they don't allow GMOs into the country. And <clears throat> But you're eating people's DNA and you're not even aware of it. I mean, it sounds really gross. It sounds really gross. So this prayer is going to help you and keep you well. 
because you cannot live 100% GMO free in America. You need to buy organic, but it's so expensive. Well, you can pay for it now, pay for it later. That's right. Medicine's expensive too. And medicine's expensive too. Yeah. Okay? And you don't, you, you, a lot of the stuff you flat do not know what you get in your food. Okay? And so that's very, very important that you understand that. <clears throat> so if you say, oh, I haven't had a blood transfusion, you know, you don't know where you've gotten anybody, somebody's blood. You really don't. You know, as a child, you know, you swap blood with your best friends. That's a covenant. All, this is a very, blood, blood is very, very important here. Okay? So we're going to say this prayer together. Whether you think you've had a blood transfusion or not, we're just going to keep going. Same. Okay. <laughs> He's standing and saying it. You're welcome to sit. You're welcome to stand, whatever you want. Just say, Father, Father I, repent I repent for my sins, for my sins and, the sins of my and the sins of my fathers. Take this sin from us. Take this sin put, it on the cross, put it on the cross. Never to be held against us again. Never to be held against us again. In Jesus' name, In Jesus name the generational curse the generational of cancer is now broken off of me. Cancer is now broken off. Of diabetes is broken off of me. High blood pressure is bro broken off of me. Varicose veins is broken off of me. Poverty is broken off of me. Everybody gets really loud on that one. Okay? Now, I'm going to take a break right there and just say, you know what else is in your family. You just keep going, make a list when you go home, and you take care of it. Okay? And then now we're going to go, Father... I repent, I repent for my sins, my sins and the sins of whose blood, sins of whose or, blood DNA, or DNA or GMO, GMO I may have received yes. or body part transplant body part or rogam or, or um, blood transfusions, blood transfusions. Body, part body part transplants. I repent for my sins. And all of their sins, take their sins, take the sins from us, put it on the cross, never to be held against us again. Anything bad that came in through that blood, take it from me now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Some of you may even feel different. Some of you may feel like your, your, your heart is lighter and, you know, and that type of thing. After schools, sometimes people go home and they'll weigh themselves and they'll be five pounds less. Yeah, so this is good. Got their attention on that one. I did. They're going to really listen now. Okay, now, I'm going to encourage everybody to donate blood. Ooh. Your Holy Ghost blood, generational curse free, going into somebody who needs to know Jesus, and they're going to wake up going, I got to go to King of Kings. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay? You know, talk to the spouse. You know, I, I, I had an encounter with Jesus while I was under. All this kind of stuff. It's just like really, really awesome. And so just get ready for incredible things to start happening in your life. Number one, you're free of all the generational curses. Number two, that if you donate blood, they say that it, in particular if a man donates blood every 57 days, he'll never have a heart attack. And men tend to have a little bit too much iron in their blood, which can damage the heart. And so by eliminating the a pint of blood uh, on every two months, then it causes the excess iron to go out. Okay, so it's a, a very good, healthy way of doing it. And the blood mobile will be here about 5 o'clock. <laughs> no, just kidding. Just kidding. But, but seriously, really pray about donating blood. That's a great point. Wow. Yeah, just think about it. I mean, talk about a, a you know, prayer cloth. They can't get rid of it. <laughs> it's in them. Okay? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, now we're going to go on to vows and covenants. Uh, when I got divorced, once again, about 17 years ago, they said, renounce the soul ties. I said, okay, the name of Jesus, I renounce the soul ties. I felt a little better. I really didn't. It, 
I didn't really understand exactly what that was. I know what soul ties are today, uh, and they're they're very important. But they're uh, when, when I got married, I did not go into a soul tie. I went into a covenant. That's right. And in the process of going into the covenant, then I was still in covenant with a man sleeping with other men. That means everything he was doing, I'm a part of. That deserves three yucks. Yuck, yuck, yuck. Okay, if you ever had Marilyn Hickey in, she always likes to do the three. Yuck, yuck, yuck. Okay? And it is. It's yuck, 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 yuck. Yuck, 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 yuck. And so when I got that revelation, about two years after the divorce, I was no longer in covenant another five minutes. And it was like, whoa. Because sometimes you just kind of feel slimed and yucky, and you find out why. Is because somebody that you're in covenant with has been doing something that's not of God. Soul ties are people that are very, very, very close to each other. It can be girlfriends. It can be, um, and obviously between a husband and wife, but it can be girlfriends, male friends, not sexually involved, okay? And it can be between a boss and an employee. Uh, it can be between a pastor and a congregant. Um, you know, it can be between a male and female friend, okay? But they're very, very close, Okay, uh, Jonathan and David had a soul type relationship. They did not have a sexual relationship. Right. Okay, so and so you have a situation. Okay, now here we have the woman at the well. Jesus says you've been married five times, and the man that you're with now is not your husband. She did not walk the aisle five times. She had sex with five men. In the Bible, that's considered marriage. Yes. Yes. Okay, and so then at that point, go and sin no more. Everything was broken and, and etc. So <clears throat> anybody that you have ever had sexual intercourse with or any kind of sexual relations with, incest, um, rape, all those have formed a covenant. And the hardest one for me to pray for is for somebody that's had, got a covenant with their dad or their father. That one's tough. Okay? I mean, I say the words, but I'm like, how can a man do that to his daughter? And then the daughter for years carries it around that it was her fault that she did something to entice her dad. A three-year-old, five-year-old cannot do that. Or anybody bring any, entice a man. It's a disease and, uh, and it needs to be stopped. It's a, it's a spirit thing. Okay? And then in addition to that, I'm going to lead you in the prayer uh, if you're divorced or your husband or your spouse has died. If your spouse has died, the covenant itself is broken at the death. But the second part is anything bad, and we'll take, and that's just good to say the prayer because it won't hurt you to say the prayer. And then, and then in the area of pornography, many times people, not just men, but people will quit pornography, but they can't have a computer in their home because there's pop-ups all the time. Okay? And they can't do it. And then they get sucked back in. When they get sucked back in, it's worse than it was before. Because of a covenant. But there wasn't any sexual situation. And so the first time we ever prayed for somebody, he begged. And we, we went ahead and prayed with him. He got so set free, it was absolutely astronomical. And I said, okay, time out, God. I need scripture. As a man has done it in his heart, he's done it. Okay? It's the covenant that keeps sucking people back in to pornography. I don't know why I went back into it. Covenant. And it's almost uncontrollable as it draws people back in. Yeah. That's going to be a tremendous asset to the church. I have so many pastors tell me, they said it's, actually, it's the first time that they've ever, ever had um, real freedom in the church. Which I thought was pretty cool. So I'm going to say the first prayer if you are divorced or spouse is deceased. And then, we'll, then I'll explain the second one. So f just say, Father, Father, I went into covenant with George. Who, you say whoever it was. Some of you don't want to. I say generic George because that's not his real name. And uh, I went into covenant with George. We're no longer married. So I renounce that covenant. Anything bad that came in through the covenant, take it from me now, in Jesus' name. Isn't that good? 
Okay, part two. I will say you do not have to repeat, but you'll have the general model. It's in the prayers are in the book. Okay, and just I went into an ungodly covenant with George. That was sin. I repent for the sin. Take it from me now. Put it on the cross. And in Jesus' name, I renounce the covenant with George. Anything bad that came in through it, take it from me now in Jesus' name. Number one comment. I have two main ones. Do I have to do all of them? Yes. It may not be all of them a lot, but it's, you know, sometimes it can be. I have a prostitute who works, ex-prostitute, I should say ex-prostitute, who works for me. Okay, and she's as clean as the rest of us. Some of you in here have actually talked with her and, and she's prayed with you. Okay, but you know what? She's not labeled prostitute anymore. She's set free. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. And then, but it was just a one night stand. It's still a covenant. I have a friend that was in the Navy and um, about five years ago, this guy calls him up and says, are you Adrian? And he says, yes. He goes, I'm your son. What? Michael's 35, at the time was 35 years old. Married, got four kids. So, and uh, he, they always, he always wanted a son and he, he had one, just didn't know about it. And uh, Rebecca always wanted a brother and then just met Michael. And it's just like a, it's like a family made in heaven. It's just really neat how God brought them all back together. And, uh, but the thing is, it's like, and another bit, bit of the story, Adrian and Bonnie, they couldn't have any children. And we prayed and uh, Rebecca is, I think, 24, 25 now. So if y'all want babies, we're anointed to pray for babies. We got anointed booties. And we see that's how you make the church grow with lots of babies. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Because their parents are going to go. Okay, so I'm going to just say the prayer. You're welcome to say it with me, but do not feel obligated to say it with me. You do need to say it out loud in the privacy of your own home. Okay? Because faith comes by hearing. You need to hear it. Okay? And so, uh, Father, I went into an ungodly covenant and, and it was pornography with another person, incest, rape, whatever it is. Okay? And I renounce that covenant in Jesus' name. You keep going like that. And then, once again, a little bit further in-depth prayer. As you say that, you're going to see yourself, and the more that you say it, as many times as you need to say it, the more that you say it, the freer you're going to get. You know, and this is not a time of condemnation. I want you free. Okay, and what's under the blood is under the blood, but we need to make sure that the blood covenant is broken. Okay, and got to check the time here. I can see why y'all don't have a clock up because you could just go teach forever. Okay, but I know y'all need to eat. Some of you do anyway. And, uh, okay, what I want to do is um, I'm going to talk about finances. Because, and that's on page number 105. Um, pretty much everybody that comes for prayer around the world has finances on their prayer list. Uh, there's probably nobody in here has too much money. Okay? If there is, there's a couple of really good places that we could help you. Joan Hunter Ministries and King of Kings. Okay? Because right now... You know, we, we need about somewhere between two and three million dollars to do the next phase in the ministry. And we really need about 300,000 to do the parking lot, reten detention pond, things like that, that really have to be done within three weeks. Somehow or another, that parking lot's going to get in. Amen. And I'm, you know, and, and somehow or another, it's going to get in. I don't know how, I don't know what all is going to happen, but I know it's going to get in. And um, because we, I mean, we're not at the point where we want it. We need it. Desperately need it. And, um, and so I'm going to share a little bit in regards to um, the fish. You did it. You covered all the scriptures, but I'm going to give you a little Jonism. Jonism plus a few trips to Israel thrown in with it. Because see, everybody is familiar with the, the teaching that she gave and the scripture that she gave. And so here we have a situation, and I don't know how they depict Peter in there, but I, I depict Peter as a real ego type, big, burly man, and not lovey-dovey like, and small like John was. Right, right. Okay? So I don't know what the movie is, but uh, what, you know, what, what, how they depict Peter. But he wasn't the lovey-dovey type. And so here we have a situation that years and years and years and generations and generations are fishermen. They did not have like DeVry University or, or you know, University of Phoenix. They didn't have that. Whatever your dad was, that's what you were. You know, and Jesus was a 
He was a carpenter. Yes, he was a savior, but he was a carpenter. That's what his dad was. He was a very good carpenter, etc. He learned the trade very, very well. Okay? And, uh, and so here we have the situation where Jesus the carpenter, technically not a fisherman, Okay, maybe fish with his dad a little bit, but not a professional fisherman. He goes to the shore. Peter's exhausted. He's been up all night. To this day, they only fish at night in the Sea of Galilee. And then Jesus says, go back out in the daytime and then throw your nets on the other side. When fish swim in a school, they go on one side of the boat only. He says, throw it over here. Okay, so here we have a situation where Jesus and Peter, Jesus is telling him to do it. So Peter's response is, so you're telling me to go back out in the daytime, carpenter, and throw my nets on the other side, the wrong side, carpenter. But at your word, at your word I'm going to obey. I am so sure that's not what he, the way he said it. But at your word, I will obey. And I'm so going to prove you wrong. That's Peter. That's Peter's personality. Maybe some of you in here. We want to prove that giving doesn't work. Okay? We're bound and determined to prove God wrong and his word wrong. Even though it's in the word. Okay? So here we have a situation. Then Jesus go, Peter goes back out, throws the nets on the wrong side at the wrong time of the day, and he catches so much fish that two more boats have to join him to help carry him all in. How many fish were there? 153. If there's a number in the Bible, there's a reason why there's a number. There's a whole book on numbers. Yes. So numbers are important to God. Yes. Okay, so there's 153. 153 adds up to be 9. 9 is a number for harvest. 153 in the Hebrew language, there's a letter, that, that a number that corresponds with a letter, and the three letters are G-O-D, and it's also <laughs> God with us. Yeah. Okay, so that gives you a greater level of importance of that, you know, just a whole different aspect of that. And the, and the thing is, which is, is what she talked about, sometimes you just need to do things differently. Yeah. You know, people get into a rut and then they'll write a check for $25, $25, $25. They won't even pray about it. Okay, what, and God's saying, do something different. Give like 2911. Well, why 2911? Jeremiah 2911. You know, for he knows the plans that you, he has for you. They're good and prosper you and bless you. And the thing is, <coughs> you need to understand the scripture. And not just know it, because you can quote it. God takes pleasure in the poverty of the saints. Prosperity. Oh, prosperity of the saints. <laughs> some, of you, some of you have had that wrong for all these years. God takes pleasure in you being rich. Okay, yes, prosperity means more than just money. So those of you that don't like people talking about money, you just shut me off, but I'm going to pray that you open up your ears. Jesus talked more about money than he talked about love. 2,000 scriptures about money. And nobody got offended when he brought it up. What, what is wrong with the church today? You know, <coughs> I'm not talking about money so money will come to me. I'm talking about your healing of your finances so that you, God will take so much pleasure because you're so rich. Okay? Well, being rich is a sin. No, it's not. Because the word says, and I'll refer to the word quite a bit on this one. The word says Jesus became poor so you could be. So you know the scripture. Now, Jesus to become poor, Jesus had to be. Oh, that was hard for some of you to say. That's some of that BS. So I can get away with it here. For those of you that miss it, it's belief system. Some of you are going... <laughs> Bachelor of Science degree. Okay, whatever you want to call it. Where did your minds go? 
It's Jersey. It's Jersey. You know just south of New York. I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, so we've got to get over the religious thinking and the poverty mindset so that you can be rich and be biblical. Okay, it provokes people to jealousy. That's the word. You know, you got a car driving up. You had to pray over to get it started. Try witnessing to a Jew. Okay, if you have a car that you have to pray over to get here, let's pray for God to get you a new car. Okay, some of you said, well, I can't afford it. Shut your mouth. You know, all of a sudden, next Sunday, he shows up with a, I don't know what car you drive, but I know what car she drives, so I wrote in it yesterday. But all of a sudden, some, he pastor shows up in a really nice, fully loaded, extended Cadillac Escalade. Black. Most cars in this area are black, I have discovered, especially in New York. <coughs> Very tinted windows, but that's another story. Well, there goes our tithe. Oh, shut your mouth. You know, you don't know that somebody walked up to him on Wednesday and said, I got something for you. Here's the keys and it's, it's out in the parking lot. Totally free. And if God can do it for him, God can do it for you. Okay? And we work hard for our money. But that's another story. But the point is, is that we limit the blessings of God only coming through our parking, park, pocket. And all only through is by our means of making money. My God's going to supply all of my needs because of me. Some of you need to get rid of that ego. That's pride right there. And somebody walks up to you, gives you $100, wants to give you $100. No, that's okay. You don't have any money for lunch, but you re refuse it. That's poor pride. I don't want anybody to know I'm poor. You know, people give me $100. I am not poor. But you know what I say? Thank you. Thank you. You heard the testimony of Jane last night. You know, somebody says, I want to buy you to school. I want to send you over to, to Texas to get ordained. I want to do this. You know what she said? Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you. Her whole life has changed as a result of that one person doing that. Okay? She didn't say, no, that's okay. I mean, she was living in the car. Do you want to move in with us? Uh, no, that's okay. I mean, come on. My bags are packed because everything's in the car. You know? <laughs> I'm going home with you tonight. Yes, thank you, Jesus. She did know the people. And so God's going to start giving these things. Now, here's another. Um, there's lots of revelation on this, this the, these scriptures. Um, give and shall be given to you. Press down, shaken together, shall God give to you. Amen. Yes or no? Yes. No. No, 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 no. That's not what the scripture says. Okay, that's good. Is, yeah. Now, what was that scripture again? I was just saying something. Now I'm going to give you the scripture. Okay. Given it shall be given to you. Press down, shaken together shall man, 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 men, woe man, give unto your bosom. Now your bosom is your man bag, wherever you keep money. You know where women keep their money. And uh, in their pockets, in their purse, a man, you know, and, and your hand. You're going to be blessed beyond words. Okay? And so when you understand and you get this revelation that it's okay to receive money. It's okay to receive blessing. It doesn't mean, well, let me give you $100 because you're poor. No, God told me to give you $100. Amen. And God's going to use man. Now, he can make it supernatural. Had a situation happen. Lady came in. She, she was very distraught. Her mother had just died. Dad was a wreck and didn't have enough money to bury, bury her. And he was just a wreck. So he went out for a walk. You got lots of trees, for examples here. Not necessarily a really good one because there are not a whole lot of leaves on them. But went outside and was so mad and just went, Oh! And there was enough money to bury her, his wife on the floor. See, our money is actually made out of trees. So that is a supernatural. But you know what? Chances are, if you go out and shake every tree, you're going to get the rest of the leaves off. Okay? But God knows your need and he'll use super, supernatural situations to get it to you. But supernatural usually has a name with it. Yes. A human name. Yes. 
You know, not, not Michael, not the angel of prosperity and things like that. But see, in regards to the teaching about 153 and the, and the loaves and the fish, I mean, not the loaves and the fish, but the, uh, the, the cast your nets out, the wrong time, everything was wrong. Everything wasn't necessarily wrong. It was just every way we've been taught to do it, it needs to change. Okay, we've got to get out of the rut. You know, a rut is an open-ended grave. Okay, your comfort zone is where your dreams go to die. That's so good. That was, my daughter had that one, my daughter Charity. And I mean, and I, that's so powerful. Because, you know, you can go and everything that God has for you can die in that comfort zone. Because you're dealing with rejection and fear and, oh, I can't do that. I can't pray for the sick. Trust me, if anybody thought that, that was me. You know, if anybody, a lot of you in here know who my, knew who my mom was, and my mom and dad, but in particular my mom. Imagine being her daughter. It wasn't easy. Because even to this day, people compare me to my mother. I'm not my mother. God says, one's enough. <laughs> <laughs> but she was a very, very powerful woman. I'm a lot like my mother because she's my mother. Okay? And, you know, and I have a funny personality. Mom had one. Her dad had one. And, uh, and so, you know, so some of these things are going to naturally be passed down. Generational blessings. Amen. Okay? And, uh, and so when you understand the power of what I'm talking about, the power to get wealth, it is he has given you to get power to get wealth. Point to the mirror. God has given you the power to get wealth. Amen. You see all these new inventions? It could have been yours. Yeah, that's right. I have a friend of mine that um, several years ago, over probably 15, 20 years ago, she had a dream and she goes, that is the stupidest dream. Just pieces of glue on the backs of paper. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Post-it notes. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody else made the millions. I, yeah, billions. I don't want anybody to get my dream and make millions off of what was rightfully mine. Yeah. Okay, so when you understand that God's going to speak to you through your dreams, you know, and, and he, he has his own special language, you know, where that's concerned, which is like really awesome. And uh, the teaching that I'm going to give you next, more specifically out of the book, is going, can, can totally change your thinking about giving. So God loves a cheerful giver. He'll hate, he'll take it, you know, from anybody. But he'll, he, and then usually the second time you give, you are a cheerful giver because it's been multiplied back. So understand, y'all are giving in the, the church offering, yes. This, they're sowing in the church offering, yes. And that's great. We'll receive an offering for the ministry in just a little bit. But the point is, that however God tells you to put it, that's, that's all that's, that matters. And you can tell this is a really giving con congregation, which is really awesome. But, when you understand the purpose of giving, and when you understand that Jesus was rich, yeah, I can back it up with scripture, so I'll do that really quick. Some of you are going, no, nah, nah. Jesus was born, they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold, provision, frankincense, authority, and myrrh is healing. Okay, so they brought, brought provision and the authority and everything for his entire life. And his parents earthly parents did not spend it all because when at that time in the scripture Jesus 30 years old he became poor he was still rich so they didn't bring a bag of gold okay they brought camels carrying gold so if you hear the statement the camels are coming they're loaded and bringing riches okay okay so here we go prosperity starts with the heart prosperity starts with the heart next one is your trust account Okay, so I give you $100, and after the service, we go in, and uh, we go in, and, and we go to Walmart, and I see you buying 10 R-rated DVDs with that $100. Am I going to give you any more? No. Neither would you, and neither does God. Amen. Amen. And that was supposed to go for baby formula, or diapers, or something. And too many Christians abuse the finances that God has given them. You know, I got blessed with $5,000 bonus. That's awesome. Let's go spend it. When you have $10,000 of debt, you can pay off 5000 of it. Okay? How many of you have seen the movie Concussion? 
Yeah. Okay, amazing movie. Um, I think I think Will Smith deserves an Academy Award. Amen. He did a phenomenal job. Unfortunately, he didn't get it. If <clears throat> I'm not a real movie promoter, but I happen to mention two already, and he did one, so that's three, so we're out. But <clears throat> the movie Concussion, Will Smith plays a person from Nigeria, and he is a coroner, and he's a coroner in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Now, after that movie and everything that that doctor did, I am surprised that football is legal. Yeah, it's it's. I, I I was just appalled by it, and uh, and it, but but they opted to allow men to be killed because it's the American sport. Yeah, and it's money. It's it has a is it's just like you you gotta be kidding. Uh, but anyway, in this movie, one of the big leaders of the um, Steelers <clears throat> kind of went crazy, so they they brought him in. Will did an exam, couldn't find anything wrong. And uh, so then at that point, Will's going, I'm determined, I'm going to find out what's wrong with him. The head coroner says, if you do, it's on your own buck. Yeah. Right, right. So he goes, and, and off the clock, after hours, every specimen, everything, it, he has to pay for 100%. So they find out what the cause is, and basically it's... Uh, T TBI, traumatic brain injury, and a variety of other things in the in the brain stem, and uh, and so and that's and it's causing people to freak out, trying to kill their family, and they were a loving husband before they had the the, the brain injury, and so <clears throat> the head coroner asked Will Smith, uh, you know, now you're paying for all this, right? How much did it cost you? Twenty two thousand. This is several years ago, quite a few years ago. He says twenty two thousand. And, and so the guy says, where did you get that money? He says, I saved it. And th this is the point of what I'm saying here today. The coroner guy says, oh, that is so non-American. Wow. Right. Right. <laughs> I'm, I'm on the airplane and I get hit. And I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm watching it. But I, I like got so hard hit with that statement into my chair. I was like in shock because you know what? That's the American mentality. And I will tell you this. I put in $6,500 into a specific refirement account. Not retired, but a refirement account. And I had to write the check Thursday morning, I think. <clears throat> that was tough. That was hard for me to do that. And I just bought a car. And so most of my savings went into the car because I still make my car payment, but I put it in my savings account. So then when it's time to buy a car, I get my car. I can pay for it. That's, that's smart, okay? And uh, I bought the last three or four cars full, just yeah. full on, you know, paid cash. That's a miracle. And, uh, but the thing is, it's like I'm saving up not for a rainy day. I'm saving up for a vacation with my family. And it was like, mm, vacation or refirement. And I mailed the check. That was hard. That was hard because I could sure you would like to have that $6,500. But I know that God's going to make it up. But you know what? People have said it's not the American way to save money. Well, I don't have enough money to save money to, to put in the savings account. Yes, you do. It's a decision. Okay. You know, the average American is in debt way over $10,000. If you're in debt over $10,000 and it's on your credit card, what did you buy? Stuff. <laughs> Things. Things. More stuff. St stuff. Well, like what? Well, stuff. <laughs> And you're paying 10 to 25% right. on stuff you don't even know what it is. Well, I can't get out of debt. Shut your mouth. Yes. God can supernaturally wipe out the debt, not so that you can charge up your credit cards again, so that you can stay out of debt. Amen. Not so that you can charge your credit cards back up, so that you can stay out of debt. When I got my new car in November, it was pretty exciting. Um, I, I told him I, I'd already turned my other car in, and, and I said, <clears throat> I, I really need a car. I really, really need a car. 
And I said, I need to get this. We had a wholesaler that was looking. He says, we found when it was in Florida. He says, I don't know what's wrong with the car. It's $11,000 under all the other cars that are apples for apples. And uh, he says, I said, check, see if it's been in an accident, etc. I had just given $111 based on Deuteronomy 111. I said, God, I need my car. Okay? Long story short is I got that car and I actually have that car. It's great. It's a nice red um, Jeep Grand Cherokee that is so loaded. It's so perfect. It didn't even have to get detailed. That's how perfect it was. And it is. Okay? It does need a wash right now. But, but the point is, I saved $11,000 on that car. That's really about 15000 that I don't have to work for. So my insurance, I, I called my insurance, got it covered on insurance, and, uh, and I left a voicemail. So she called me back. She says, the only thing you left out was who the lender was. <laughs> I started crying. I said, there is no lender. I said, I paid cash. I was completely broke in the year 2000. Had nothing. Started my life over with nothing. Not even a zero. I had a zero credit score. Not because of bad credit, but because of zero credit. I live in an amazing house right now that I got half price. Come on. Hallelujah. And it's on a lake. It's five bedroom, you know, and four and a half bath. And the study is also an extra bedroom when we have extra people there because my house is Cramelot Inn, like y'all's house. Okay? And, uh, but the point is, to be able to say that when, you know, in, in 17 years ago, I had two car payments, three girls in college, and I had nothing. I had, my, my pay was $1,600 a month. I was working for a car dealership. It was $1,600 a month. My take home was $1,200 after insurance and taxes. My tithe was $160 because I believe in tithing off the gross because I want to give my father first fruits, not my uncle, Sam. Okay, and I know you talk about first fruits because it's on your offering envelopes here. Okay? And that's important that we give God the first of everything before we give it to the government, before we give it to insurance. You're welcome. And uh, when you get, when you get the uh, revelation of that, you'll actually have more money if you give more. <clears throat> because like in saving $11,000, you know, that's $15,000 at least. So here we had $1,200 take home, house payment $1,100. And a, a tithe of 160 is minus $60 every month. Two car payments, three girls in college, utilities, food, etc. But I never went into debt. God met my every need. Amen. I would come home from work, hallelujah, and my house would be so completely trashed out. And I'm like, what did they do while I was at work? It was over 50 bags of groceries that couldn't fit in the pantry or the fridges. Come on. And it was literally everywhere. Okay? And so my God shall supply all of my needs. Not according to my employer, but according to my needs. <clears throat> Amen. Garbage in, garbage out. You know, you listen to the news, CNN, constant negative news. It also has another, other anacronyms, but we'll just leave it at that one. And, but you listen to that garbage, and you are, it breeds fear in the body of Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay? We have got to not allow that to breed fear into our lives. Amen. We've got to get rid of the fear. Overcome by faith. Well, I don't have any faith in finances. You have at least a grain of a mustard seed. Next one is get rid of the poverty mindset. I'm po. I'm always going to be po. I've been poor in my life and I've been po. Po, you can't afford the other O. That's really poor. <laughs> That's digging out of garbage cans in order to have enough food to eat. Been there, done that. Okay, I don't have to do that anymore. Now, I can go to the store and I can buy a peach without a spot, without a blemish. You have no idea how good that feels. Amen. Instead of digging them out of garbage cans, hoping to get a, a, a bowl of fruit out. Okay, and disgusting as that was. Okay, and see, I understand. I know what poverty is. Yeah. I understand. 
So it gives me even greater grounds to, to teach on this. Okay, got to get rid of the poverty mindset. My dad was poor, my grandpappy was poor, everybody was poor, I'm going to be poor. And, and my, grand, my aunt, my mom's sister, had a poverty mentality. I don't have any money for food, I don't have any money for food, she would call my mom. My mom would sacrifice, get together $500 and send it to her. This is 20 years ago, 30 years ago now. And was sent it to her. When my aunt died, she had over $500,000 in her savings account. Poverty mentality. She had to save for the rainy day. She had no freedom in spending unless my mom took care of it and paid for everything. Okay? And uh, now here's, here's the, the next really strong key here. There are three major blocks to financial freedom. And we're going to remove these blocks. Okay? And, and as we remove them, you're going to see it's like there's a dam being built in front of you and the flow is not here. I believe that since March 11th, 17th, the 20th, and now, that there is a release of finances to the body of Christ like never before. And that's not a, a prophetic word that I'm talking in the natural. It has been released in the natural. It is being released in addition to that into the spirit realm. Blessings are pouring in that you can't even comprehend. So I want you to get ready for what God's got in store for you. <clears throat> I know you are. Number one, repent for foolish spending. You know, you check out at the grocery store, no matter where you are, Target, Walmart, grocery store, etc. And they have this aisle right here of all this stuff you got to have, including all the candy bars. Okay? As seen on TV. Okay? All those things. It's like, oh, I could really use that. So you get home a few years later and you're still trying to figure out what to do with this stuff because you haven't even opened it. Okay? That's foolish spending. Okay? And you need to concentrate on things that will help you and not just plain junk. Okay, number two, repent for any time you haven't tithed. I'm going to help you out in this area. I'm going to so help you out in this area. Okay, people say it was before the law, during the law, it's after the law, you have to tithe. There are some people who say, hey man, you don't have to tithe. It's grace. They never wanted to tithe to begin with. Right, right. Amen. Okay. And then I'm going to tell you what I believe, and I know that the pastors will line up with what I believe. Because I feel very strongly, you no longer have to tithe because of the letter of the law. You get to tithe because of love. Amen? And instead of getting paid $1,000 and tithing $100, give like $111. The $11 is not going to make or break you, but it's going to go into really good ground for supernatural multiplication. And as you pray and you ask God, how much should you give out of your paycheck? God will tell you. And then come this time next year, you're going to be looking at your, your taxes and you go, wow, I gave like 30 to 40% of my income away, but I have more than I've ever had before. Oh, amen. And we, we give somewhere between 30 and 40% of our income, our gross income away. And we have more than ever. Because how can you, I mean, $11,000 off of a car? Right, right. I mean, and, and it's, it's, the thing is perfect, you know? I, was like, I, I can't believe it doesn't have bun warmers. Every once in a while, you need those in Houston, <laughs> once in a blue moon. And, uh, and I'm like, this is really awesome. I, you know, I'd love to have, you know, and I'm like, I, I, don't, you know, I, I, can't, I can't find the button. I can't figure it out. And so I thought, I wonder what this button is for. You know, a new car. So I pushed it. I was like, oh, there's a little red seat. It's all computerized now. So I punch it, and I thought, ooh, yeah. <laughs> so the next morning it was still rather cool so I got in the car and so I, I knew where to punch now and I said so I punched it and I said oh I don't know what that is let's find out what that is and so I punched it I had no idea what it was and so I'm driving down the road going to the office and I'm glad it was really close and I'm like something's wrong with the car something's wrong with the engine I don't know what is going on here you know my steering wheel is so hot <laughs> I have a heated steering wheel. I didn't even know they had those things. So my car is fine. It just had some bells and whistles I've never heard of before. That's called exceedingly abundantly above all you could ever ask, hope, dream, or imagine. Okay. Now, the third one, which is extremely important. Anytime you didn't give an offering when God said to give an offering. When God said to give an offering. 
Okay, John Brown, not Joan Hunter, comes in here. If you know John Brown, that's not what I'm talking about. But John Brown comes in and he says, um, God spoke to me this morning while I was getting ready. Everybody in here should give $1,000. And so, some of you just went, Whoa. Okay, I didn't say that. I'm just using this as an example. If you don't give in that kind of an offering, that is not the sin of disobedience. If, and when we're going to pray here in just a few minutes for God to speak to you, how much he would have you give in the offering. And if make, God says $111, if you give $100, that's still the sin of disobedience. That's right. Amen. Right. Okay? God is looking for people that will listen to him and obey. And do what he's asked because in doing what he's asked you to do, you're going to reap. But sometimes it's just like me giving to the, the re refirement account. You know, I knew I needed to do it. I didn't want to do it. But the same thing, you know, in, the my, in my back of my mind, I'm going, I can't afford it. I'm like, the money is there. I would prefer not to do that. But I did it anyway. Some of you will look at the, what's in the natural and I can't afford to give X amount, whatever God's telling me. Okay, what you're doing is you're putting your feelings and what you think in front of what God, because God wants to receive your seed and bless it and multiply it. Amen. There's a guy supposed to be here tomorrow at church. And uh, he's coming uh, from probably from the Delaware area. It's, it's John and Norma's son. He came into a service um, a year ago, I think it was a year ago, December. I know it was December. And he came in and he was planning on giving $50. And God says, I want you to give 500 He goes, 50, 50. <laughs> okay, God says 500, 50. Do I hear 50? <laughs> and, and he kept hearing 500. And so he's like, okay. So he gave the 500. And that was, I think, on Sunday morning. So Monday he goes to work and he works for this great company, but they don't give bonuses. They don't give bonuses. He walked in and says, I need to see you in my office. <laughs> Am I fired? You know, everybody thinks a negative. Right. He goes in there and he says, you've done such a great job. We're giving you a check for $5,000 bonus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. And I don't know, five, ten dollars an hour raise. And he's gotten multiple bonuses. He's gotten multiple raises since that time. Raise. What is it? $5,000 And just got another $5,000 raise. Wow. And it all stemmed back to obedience. Yeah. And whatever God tells you to give, no matter if it's here, you know, no matter where it is in your regular church service, if this is your home church, if God tells you to give a certain amount, you need to do it and trust God. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Okay? So we're going to receive the offering and we're going to pray over this first and then I'm going to pray. <clears throat> I'm going to pray, uh, have you repent. And I'm going to ask you to pray for God to speak to you and then that's what you give. Okay? Just say, Father... I repent for any foolish spending. And I repent for any time I haven't tithed. And I repent for any time I didn't give an offering when you told me to give an offering. All of that is sin. Take the sin from me, put it on the cross, never to be held against me again. In Jesus' name, once again, the curse of poverty is now broken off of me. Broken off. And any of these strongholds that have withheld my finances are now broken off. The dam that has blocked it is now imploded in Jesus' name. And Father, speak to me how much you would have me to give. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Ushers are going to hand out offering envelopes.